What's up, everybody? Tonight, we are going to talk about one of the topics that we get asked the most, about the most, on our blog and videos and socials and all that good stuff. And that is fly photography. So we're gonna learn to take what tools we have here and I'll show you what I use and give you some other options that that run the gamut of super cheap to pretty spendy, but all for taking photos of the fancy pretty flies that you tie and make them look as nice as possible. And one thing that we're not gonna do is we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about Canon versus Nikon versus Sony versus whatever. The tools we'll talk about and the techniques are simply that, they're tools usually in the hands of somebody who's got it dialed in. It's not gonna matter if they're using a uh, Sony or a Canon. It's all gonna be the same with a few minor exceptions, but we'll talk about those. Because at the end of the day, it really depends on what your budget is and what you're after. Are you gonna be shooting photos for a big photo spread in a catalog with flies? Or are you gonna blow these up into prints? Are you gonna sh share them on Facebook or Instagram? That will also help determine what your budget should be and what of these tools that you may use when it comes to taking your photographs. So again, the goal is for you to learn some new tips some tricks so that you can hopefully take better photos, learn some new techniques, and up your game when it comes to taking photos and videos of the stuff that you tie. All right, so we're gonna talk about three main categories of tools that we're gonna use. The first category, kind of starting at the lower end would be your handy dandy smartphone and more specifically some of these uh, convenient little clip-on lenses that you can use to uh, do macro telephoto whatever obviously you're talking about macro today the second option is one that I don't have sitting handy is that that's just your typical point-and-shoot camera some of which have macro features so those can also be good they're gonna run a little bit more than say a phone would phone I say cost wise because you're using it for other things and then the third option is going to be a DSLR camera or a mirrorless camera or micro four thirds basically something with interchangeable lenses that you can put a macro lens on specifically and use that to take your photos so that's kind of the upper end down to the lower end which is my phone All right, so before we get into all of our goodies, there's a few things that you wanna keep in mind when it comes to photography. Doesn't matter if you're using a phone, a point and shoot, or a fancy big boy camera. So the first consideration is lighting. Probably the biggest challenge that I see when people are taking photos and they wanna up their game, the biggest thing that they can do to improve, regardless of the tool, is gonna to be to have adequate lighting on the subject. So we're talking flies here, it doesn't have to be a big old huge photo studio like I've got here but the best thing to do is get a little light box you can buy one or you can make one one thing I have noticed if you're going from something like a phone lighting becomes super super important because you don't have as much flexibility to adjust the the exposure and the lighting and the different things associated to taking the photo with the phone that you do with a, a bigger camera with interchangeable lenses these are totally fully manual. You can change any setting you want in any direction you want. The phones are gonna be a lot more limited. Your point and shoots are probably somewhere in the middle. Now, as far as light types go, I usually use a combination of LEDs. Right now I have four light sources on my light box. And honestly, the lights don't have to be anything special. If you see right here, this is just a, some cheap old Home Depot light. I actually got it at a thrift store for five bucks. Um, another one's just like a table lamp light with an LED and then I have another one that's specifically made for a light box that also is LED. So when all said and done, the most important I think is to have a couple of different light sources coming in from different angles and have the light diffused. Doesn't matter if you do it with a light box or some other sort of material. Again, Google that up. You'll find tons of options. We don't have time to talk about them all here, but that's really an expensive way to get started and you don't need to lay down a bunch of money for a big light box. Okay, second big thing. You need to keep your camera as still as possible. Whenever I can, and I very, very rarely shoot handheld, I'll use a tripod. So you could use something as quick and easy as one of these Joby style Gorilla Pods. And you could even you could use this with DSLRs. It's, it's big enough to handle that. Or a point and shoot. 
You can also get a little adapter for your phone that will screw into this for a tripod. Just Google up iPhone or Android uh, tripod mount phone holder. And that will allow you to get a super still shot. Probably besides light, I mean, you could overcome lighting if you had poor lighting, if you kept it still and used the settings on the photo, the photo device, phone, whatever, to uh, take the photo. But if it's not still, you don't have a chance. So it's important to have a tripod. I've got a few of them that I use. Again, it depends on the application. Um, my bigger one that I use kind of standby with my light box. Is, it's got a nice uh, ball head on it so I can adjust the angle that I'm shooting uh, pretty easily. But again, you can pick up a pretty inexpensive tripod on Amazon or wherever. You could also go with something as simple as this. And if you want to really go cheap, there's knockoff gorilla pods that you can find as well. Uh, this isn't going to hold a DSLR usually, but uh, you can help, you can use it with, again, with your phone or with a point and shoot, a smaller one. Okay, the second part of keeping your camera really still is you typically don't want to be in physical contact with your camera when you snap a photo. So in order to do that, I use a little remote trigger. And the way it's set up, and it depends on the camera, that you set the camera up, compose your shot, step away, keep everything still, and then click the button on this. There's some that have little cords that go into your camera. If you're using a phone, set it, the, delay, the timer to a two second delay, compose your shot, press the button, step away. After two seconds, it takes a shot. When you're not touching it, nothing's gonna be moving hopefully, and you'll get as crisp and sharp a photo as possible because nothing's moving it. Even a slight bit of movement, I found moving in my seat next to the tripod can sometimes move it enough to add some blurriness to the shot. So keep your camera as still as possible when you're taking your shots. All right, one other thing, again, it doesn't matter what you're doing or what you're using to take a photo, it's important to have a good background. What I'll use, I go to the craft store and I get these little Silly Winks foam sheets. They're like a buck. It's a two millimeter foam. You can also use it to tie flies with. But I'll have these on hand for background colors. Probably my most favorite are black and white, but I'll have blue, maybe greens, a couple of lighter oranges. It just depends on what you're doing, but it's important to have a good background. Now, it doesn't have to be a solid color. You can go and buy some crazy construction paper or something that has a pattern on it, but I found to get the fly as clean as possible and to stand out against the background, you want a good background. It's super simple. You just stick it behind there. Don't use your hand. Uh, your hand's probably not the greatest background for a uh, to take a photo like that. Obviously, just holding flies in the hand, it's a different story. The other thing too is it's not really great when you have a whole lot of fly tying crap in the background. It's really simple. Get a piece of foam or paper, stick it behind the fly in the background, boom, easy background. And it costs you a buck. Now, at the same time, if you're doing flies, they're gonna sit on a surface. What I do is I go down to Home Depot or Lowe's and you can get samples of things like tile and wood flooring and I'll and these are free Again, we're kind of keeping as low budget as possible and I will set that down you can set your flies right on the surface I bought a little piece of metal at the craft store I think it was a buck and a tile from Home Depot this is maybe 25 cents I don't know but they're really simple you can use all sorts of colors of different things but again something that's going to give the fly something to sit on and uh, that presents a good background surface to take the photo on. But just mess around with different options until you find some of the things that you like. I like to mix it up. I've probably got eight or 10 different surfaces that I use, including foam. Foam works great. You can stick the point of the fly in there and, and kind of orient it, and it works awesome like that. These ones, you can just lay the flies on and maybe take it from a different angle to so you can lay it flat if you need to. All right, now just a few words about composition. What I tend to see, and this is probably just the way that we, we tie the flies, so we orient them like that. But you'll see most of the flies taken from an orientation of just straight on from the side, which is great when I do catalog photos for, um, for catalogs with flies shown in the catalogs. They always want them straight on for some reason. If, I, if it's me, I usually like to set them at an angle, maybe set them on their side, look at it from a different angle, up above, down below but I tend to not like to do them straight on. You lose a little bit of depth and you gain, I think, a little bit more 
photographic effect if you use a different angle than just straight on. Beyond that, one of the things that I see a lot with flies is that they don't fill the frame. Now, of course, you may not have a camera or a, or a device that can fill the frame, but if I'm gonna take a picture of this fly, I want it to be framed so that most of the frame is filled by the fly. I don't wanna see the background of my fly tying area and the fly takes up like 10% of the frame. It's number one, it's hard to see the detail in that. And number two, it's distracting. So if I'm going to, when I can, I'll either fill the frame before I shoot, as I shoot, or I may crop it in, which is another advantage of a DSLR or mirrorless is you've got the power behind it to crop after you shoot. All right, now we're gonna transition away from things that everybody's gonna have to worry about, composition, lighting, all that good stuff, to now things that have to do with settings more for a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, not so much on your phone. So things are gonna start to get really nerdy real quick. Okay, starting off with the lenses, again, as I mentioned, I shoot my primary macro lens is this Tokina. Um, again, it's 100 millimeter, so you get a little bit more working distance from your fly or whatever you're shooting. Uh, so this is the one I'll use probably 90% of the time. And this smaller Sony, it's a 30 millimeter, also macro. Uh, a good one, I use this, like I said, in the, in the field a lot. I can also use it in here, it depends on if I shoot step by step for like a magazine or something, uh, I'll often use this one because I can get it between myself and the fly. Now there's a lot of considerations that when it comes to lenses. So speaking of different types of lenses, one key concept here is minimum focal distance and maximum magnification. And for the next hour and a half, I'm going to talk about those two topics. Hey. Good morning, son. How are you? Skies above. Gee, it's great to be alive and And that's everything you needed to know about lens physics. So starting with your phone, most phones aren't gonna have any sort of macro setting. So you're gonna have to get as close as you can to the subject, as still as you can and take your photo and hope for the best. Now there are some settings involved, but by and large, without, with the exception of maybe some exposure and, or maybe an HDR type thing, uh, your sharpness is what it is. And so you don't have a whole lot of flexibility there. Point and shoot, like I said, you got a macro mode, and that's about it. You're not gonna be able to change a whole lot else. However, with the DSLR, and I'd show you mine, but I'm filming with it. It's a Sony, like I said, A6500. And out of all the cameras I've used, it's my favorite one because it allows the greatest amount of flexibility, and it's a super techie, nerdy camera. So we're just gonna talk about some of the settings on the DSLR, these other cameras that can set all the settings as manual as you want and as flexible as you want. So in general, on, on my Sony, I'll shoot my macro lens in either a full manual mode, and that's where you're setting the aperture and the shutter speed yourself, or an aperture priority, where the shutter speed sets itself based on the aperture that I select. So when I'm shooting flies, I'm usually shooting an, an aperture setting of between f22 um, all the way to, say, f5-ish. And it depends. If I'm shooting and I don't have a ton of light, sometimes you need to open up the aperture a little more. But the disadvantage with the macro lens is because you're so close, if you're open at full aperture, say f2.8, which is the, the biggest that the, this lens gets, is that your focal plane is gonna be so shallow that only a little teeny section of your fly is gonna even be in focus. So that means you need to shut down your aperture, which gives you more focus plane. But when you do that, you're shutting that down and therefore needing more light to shoot, which is another reason why you need a tripod. The other thing you can do there to compensate is increase your ISO. But again, if you're shooting on a tripod, you can still shoot a low ISO, a, a shutdown aperture, and it exposed. So the shutter then is going to have to stay open for a few seconds in some cases, which is fine. But you can't, there's no way you can do that on a phone. So that's, that's where you start to gain. If you want to shoot in dark backgrounds and have a little bit more flexibility with how the lighting looks and the exposure on your patterns, that's where the, the macro lens with the fully adjustable uh, big boy camera is going to come in handy for you. Now, if you're not into that, not a big deal. 
then great. These other things will work, but the, where you get the most flexibility on your lenses with your camera and the tools is with a lens and a camera that can tweak all those settings as much as you want. Okay, done with the nerdy part. Let's talk more about some things that I see that you can watch out for to make your photos better. These are just, I go online and I usually critique everybody's photos that I can and I write them down in a little notebook and I make fun of them. Not really. But here's a list of things that I think people tend to miss the mark on when they're taking photos. Okay, number one's one I mentioned, not number one in any order, but like I mentioned, a lot of times you'll see a frame this big and the flies like that big right in the center. Obviously understand you can't help that if you don't have the capability like a macro lens or something that can get close to it, like this little clip-on macro. But when you're that far away and it's that much of a, a disparity between what's in the frame and what's not, you lose detail and it, it's very difficult to see and appreciate a fly when you don't have that level of zoom or when you don't have that level of crop. Okay, one of the other ones, and this is a super simple fix, is to throw more light on it. So many times I see people just taking out their phone, taking a photo, and not throwing any extra light on it. If I'm going to go through the trouble to take a photo and post it somewhere or do something with it, I tend to want it to be as high a quality as, as I can. So it's not going to hurt to go to the thrift store, get a $3 lamp, and have that at the ready so when you want to take your photo, you got the light source. Okay, another one is when you've got your fly in the frame, but for whatever reason you're focusing on something in the background where you don't know how to change your camera's focus so that it is focusing on the fly. A lot of DSLRs, probably most, have what's called a spot focus feature where you can actually tell it to focus right on the fly. My Sony has something called focus assist. So as I'm focusing, I get these little red striations on the subject so I can say, see exactly where the focus is. And I usually put the focus on the eye of the hook. You can't, you usually can't go wrong if you have the eye of the hook in perfect focus. Everything else, again, if you've got your aperture set right, should be okay. And it's hard to extract the details from the fly that you're photograph, that you're photog photo photo graphicking, photograph licking. That you're if you photograph a lick, if you photograph, if you take a photo, take a shot of your fly, you want it to look good. So why do I do why do I spend the extra money on a camera body and a lens for macros to take the photos? Well number one I take a lot of photos. Like I said, I take a photo about every day. Number two, I do a lot of catalog photography and magazine photography, and those guys like to have super high resolution, super clean, crisp, sharp photos. Could not ever, not in a million years, well, who knows, but probably not, I doubt it, on an iPhone or any other type of camera device, a phone camera device. So that's the other thing. It gives me flexibility. I can, I can adjust pretty much any setting to get any effect that I want or compensate for anything that I'm having trouble with. If I'm at a show and I don't have my fancy lighting setup, I can still adjust my camera down to a point where the lighting is sufficient enough for me to get for me to get the photo that I want. Now another thing that I like about a macro lens that you're not going to be able to get as much with a, a, a camera or a point and shoot is I can literally take a size 30 fly and take a full frame, a full frame filling shot of that fly. Because again, it's the way it's set up, one to one magnification, and I can take with super crispness and sharpness, I can take that photo and it's gonna look just as good as a size 10. And probably the last thing, and this is a little annoying at first, but it's made me a better tire, is that I can see, get in there the super, super magnified version of my fly and see how bad I suck at tying. Or at least give me the chance to tie it again and tie a cleaner fly. Until I start doing high-end macros like this, I wouldn't have ever seen that. But it is nice because it helps you be a better tire. Some people may not care about that, but for me, that's one of the things that I look at. I'll tie a bunch of flies, take some photos, and oh, those are those are garbage. Obviously, they'll still fish, but it can help me see. Oh, my heads are a little, you know, unkempt. I need to make them cleaner or something. So we're going to take a look at four different photos. Now, all four of these photos were shot with basically the same lighting. You'll notice the exposures are a little different. Some are brighter, some are not, because again, we're, we're dealing with the same lighting and relatively similar camera settings. So the first photo here is taken with an iPhone 6. No clip-on lens, nothing. 
It's not even zoomed in with the phone. I just get as close as I can. It's mounted on a tripod, so I hold it as still as I can and take a photo. Okay, the next photo is shot with a clip-on macro lens. So you'll notice that on this one, the eye of the hook is in focus. But as you move back out of the focal plane towards the bend of the hook, that you're losing that sharpness. Okay, the next photo I've taken is with my Sony a6500, so taken with a good camera. The only difference is this is a 35 millimeter lens. And it's an awesome lens, but the problem is that I cannot get close enough to the fly and still focus on it. So I have to take the shot a little bit further back and then zoom in on it when I crop. Problem with that is that I don't get the magnification. So if I wanna fill the frame with a fly, I'm gonna to have to zoom in on it, and now I'm gonna lose sharpness, as you can see here. It's nowhere near the quality of the macro lens, which you'll see here. Okay, now this one, taken with the macro lens on the Sony, nothing done to the image, it's simply cropped, and you'll see it's night and day difference. It's tack sharp from beginning to end, so the amount of clarity and detail that you get with this it doesn't even compare to what we see with the other photos. So when it all comes down to it, if I had to choose between those four, I think it's obvious which one you would choose. So again, if you're taking photos on a consistent basis, a macro lens is going to throw out a lot better end product. And again, this is a size 14. We go smaller, the difference becomes larger and larger between say a phone macro lens and an actual macro lens. Okay, now before I finish up, there's a couple of considerations when it comes to making videos. We get asked all the time what our video setup is, and there, it's no secret. Again, I'm using this Sony a6500. I have plenty of good lighting. As you can see here, I've got a light, a soft box that I use. Um, it diffuses the light. I've also got a light ring back here that I can use if I'm shooting video. Um, actually, I'll use this one probably more, but I, I'll have two, sometimes three day, uh, light sources when I'm shooting video. Uh, the same kind of things apply here. It's going to be almost impossible to tie to do videos with a phone unless you're tying big streamers, uh, which would be fine. Um, this macro lens, you'll have to get way, way too close to the subject to be able to have it be effective for you. The other thing is the camera itself, and this is probably a bigger consideration than with just plain photos. If I'm doing video, I want at least 1080p in 60 frames per second preferably 4K these days. So I'll shoot in 4K, it's a pain to edit, but it kind of future-proofs your footage. So, if it, I mean, even now there's, YouTube has 4K videos on there. So if you've got a 4K capability like on your iPhone 7 or some of the newer uh, DSLRs or mirrorless that have 4K built in, that's the way I would go. But if you can't, then probably something in the range of a 1080p, uh, 60 frames per second HD video quality. And most of the cameras, again, that you're going to use on the high end will have that. Where you'll start, where you're going to run into problems is with the budget cameras. That's where you're going to lose that capability. And again, a macro lens is almost imperative unless you're tying bigger flies all the time and exclusively. And then with video, as I mentioned before, if I'm shooting first person video, which I don't like as much, I can mount the shorter focal length macro lens in front of me because it can be closer to the fly and focus effectively and give still fills the frame as opposed to my 100 millimeter which I like more because that gives I'm not I'm not going to be hitting the the lens as I wrap or do anything so that's why I like the 100 millimeter a little bit better because it gives me more working space and if I need to tie bigger flies I just back it up so it's not that's not an issue if I have to get super close to it I'm going to be hitting the lens and, and there's nothing I can do about that. It's, it's the focal distance and there's, it is what it is. So one last thing to answer some of the questions that we've gotten regarding budget or entry level setup. To summarize everything we've talked about, I think it's safe to say that if you want to go low end and you have a smartphone, economically speaking, this clip on macro lens is probably the way to go. If you don't have a smartphone or anything that could use a macro uh, clip on like this, then the next option that I would recommend is 
save your money, spend on a low-end body of a, a DSLR or mirrorless, and then spend the real money on the lens or the glass. You'll get far more bang for the buck spending, say, 350, $200 to $350 for a good macro lens than you would with a state-of-the-art body. You can get entry-level DSLR or mirrorless bodies that support interchangeable lenses for anywhere from $350 to $500. And a lens, again, probably averages two to $350. So really for $500, you could start off with something that's relatively decent, five to $600. You could go used, check out your classifieds. Uh, Facebook Marketplace has some. I'm pretty confident that you could get set up pretty nice on the low end for four to $500. That's about as much as you'd spend for a point and shoot with the macro feature, which is my third choice. That would be kind of your um, budget, not ideal scenario. So if you're, again, if you're gonna really start out cheap, inexpensive, clip on, next step up, I'd go macro and spend your dollars wisely. If budget's not as big an issue, I'm super impressed with the Sony I shoot with. It's super techy nerdy. It's got some features that I like that, um, don't, that you don't see in regular DSLRs. So that would be the choice I would go with the Sony A-Series, um, either the uh, crop sensor, APS-C, or the full frame if you want to spend a lot of money. Okay, that's about it. I hope this has been helpful to you. If you haven't already, check out our website, flyfishfood.com. And from there, you can see a lot of other fly tying tutorials, gear reviews, and different things that we do on our YouTube channel also there. Let us know if you have any questions or comments in the comments below. Subscribe to our channel. We'll catch you on the flip side.